Hello and welcome to lecture 19 where we're going to begin to cover chapter 25 on the topic of optical devices. In this first lecture we're going to introduce um, the following three optical devices, the human eye, microscopes, and telescopes. Talk briefly about some of the terminology and some of the key formulas that we'll need. We want our, um, in our objectives, we want to learn um, the optical um, differences between farsighted and nearsighted and the meaning of a diopter. We also want to learn and understand the appropriate formulas for compound microscopes and telescopes. Okay, so um, as far as terminology, let's get into the key things that we're going to be talking about, and that's the idea of farsighted and nearsighted. Okay, so first let's talk about um, farsightedness. Okay, so what do I want to say about farsightedness? Okay, well, first of all, the other term for it, the technical term, is hyperopia. Okay, and what farsightedness means is that you can see things well that are far away, but you cannot see nearby objects. So see objects far away but cannot focus near objects, nearby objects. All right, so it's farsighted. You can see far, but you can't see near. Now, as far as the picture, I think um, the uh, diagrams to the side, I think are very um, illustrative of what's going on. So for farsighted, if you look at an object that's far away, you can see with rays, right, our key tool here to understanding optics, we have a ray that comes in that would be essentially parallel to the eye, and then that ray gets nicely focused on the back of the eye where the retina is. However, a nearby object comes in, and it does not get focused on the retina, but instead focuses behind the retina, thus creating a blurry image that our brain recognizes, okay? And so then to correct for farsightedness, we need a converging lens so that the focal point of nearby objects is moved forward, thus landing on the retina rather than behind the retina. Okay, so that's the other key thing, is it's corrected by a converging lens, because we need to move that focal point forward. Okay, so what's the other type of vision issue? Okay, vision type. Well, that is myopia. And myopia is nearsightedness. That means you can see things near, but not far away. So see objects near, but cannot focus far away objects. All right. So take a look at the ray diagram again. We have a far away object. We see that it's being nicely focused. Um, or excuse me, we can see that the, um, the faraway object is not being focused. Instead, its focal point is here in front of the retina, kind of floating in the middle of the eye, thus creating a blurry image that is out of focus that's actually landing on the retina. All right, and then we look and we see for, and we look at an object that is, um, let's see, yeah, so for a, near, for a nearby object, let's see where we want, so we have, there's one thing I think that I'm not looking at correctly here in the image, farsighted and nearsighted. So yes, so see objects near, whoops. Um, yeah, so I mean, ultimately the, the effect is that we're gonna correct it with a diverging lens, but I just wanna make sure that so see objects near, okay. So essentially when we're trying to look at this for objects that are far away, um, the image is not, is not being focused. So it's, it's not so much this one here. This, this would represent the nearby object in the case for nearsightedness. And I know it's not um, quite as clear as um, in this, this column here, but if we look, we can see that this, this is representing a, a nearby object that's getting relatively focused on the retina. But when an object is further away, then we have we have a case where the object is not not being focused where it needs to be. 
So instead, we use a, di a diverging lens to move that focal point back and actually land on the retina. So nearsightedness is corrected for by a diverging lens. So corrected by diverging lens. Okay, so those are the two types of vision and the two ways that we can use lenses to correct for them, okay? So that's one, one optical device, glasses, all right, used in combination with the human eye. And you really, you know, this is a two, this is a two lens effect here, it's human eye lens plus the lens of the glasses or contact, contacts, whatever it may be. But now let's talk about some other optical devices, starting with the microscope, okay? So the compound microscope is a two lens device. So it's a device made with two converging lenses. All right. And in doing so, it um, those two lenses are called the objective and the eyepiece. Objective lens and eye piece. Okay, eye piece lens, often just called the eye piece. Really the, the ray diagram sort of show, tells it all. I have one version of the ray diagram here. I have another one in the key formulas on the next page. Um, they're kind of interchangeable, but I just wanted to have show two, two different versions of the diagram. But we can see that there's two converging lenses. We can see that there is a object here. This would be maybe your slide that you're looking at through a microscope. That object is having an image that is created, okay? That is a um, that is a real image that's being created, okay? And then what's going to happen is this this real image is inside the focal length of the eyepiece, the second converging lens. Thus, the second converging lens will create an image out of the real image from the first lens, and that image created by the second lens, thus the secondary image, will actually be a virtual image, thus one that the human eye can, um, can discern, and that virtual image is gonna be over here. And it'll be quite a bit larger than the original, the original object, and quite a bit larger than the first real image. All right, so we can see here, the eyepiece uses the image eye as an object and creates an enlarged virtual image eye, still inverted, okay? Because it got inverted when the real image was created, and virtual images are always upright. In other words, they remain inverted. All right. So definitely uh, the diagram tells that story quite well, um, as, as do the captions. Now, before we talk about the telescope, which is the other device that we're going to spend a minute discussing, we want to define a term that we haven't really used before, and that's angular magnification. Now, we, we already have magnification, um, which is just the, the height of the object. Um, divided by the height, or excuse me, the height of the image divided by the height of the object, right? And negative, so it's negative, negative h object divided by h, um, excuse me, negative h image divided by h object. Um, that's been our magnification formula. And the negative just tells us if it's upright or not, you know, and the sign convention clears up all of that. And obviously virtual images are always upright, real images are always inverted, okay? We got that. But What's angular magnification? Well, in many ways, it's a simpler concept. It's simply the idea that it's the angle that the object subtends, right? That's how big it is, you know, how much of it, it's of our visual space does it take up, and then compare that to the angle that the image covers, okay? So we can really think of angular magnification, all right, as, as being the, um, the, basically the ratio of the angle subtended by the object um, divided by the angle, um, so excuse me, the angle subtended by the image divided by the angle subtended by the object. So let's write that down. So ratio of angle subtended, that's just covered by image All right, so, well, if I'm gonna say ratio over, I'll say ratio of angle subtended by image to angle subtended by 
object. All right, so instead of comparing their sizes, we're just comparing their angular coverage, okay? Their angular size, if you will. And that's it. That's the, that's the whole idea of angular magnification. All right? So angular magnification is important for, um, for, for objects, um, you know, so, um, such as like that we would use in astronomy. So, um, for example, you know, um, the, so stars, for example, um, are so far away that they, um, they're always going to, so I guess, um, so angular magnification really isn't going to show up for a star because it covers so little space, but for something like the moon, um, it's a really, it's a really good fit because we think of like kind of the angular size of the moon without any magnification. And if we look at the angular size of the moon with magnification, it's going to cover a much, much larger angle in terms of, uh, in terms of our vision. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. And so that's going to take us to the refracting telescope. So when we look at the refracting telescope, we see that in many ways it looks a lot like the compound microscope. It's two converging lenses. So a device made with two converging lenses. The difference is that notice where the image from the first lens is being, is being put. The image is located right at the focal point, okay? So that's, that's key, because that means that, that it, that's not the case with a microscope. With the microscope, the image really isn't happening right at the focal point, right? We're not, we're not getting an image that we're gonna see with a relaxed eye. We're not getting an image that, that's infinitely far away. With a telescope, we always assume that the image must be viewed with a relaxed eye. In other words, it must be at an effective infinite distance because that's what happens when you put an object, in this case, the image from the first lens at the focal point of the second lens, then that secondary lens, that eyepiece, will create an image that is infinitely far away, all right? And because of that, because of, because of that effect, it makes our calculation of the overall magnification of the telescope um, pretty straightforward to calculate um, but it also makes the telescope less effective for magnification. But telescopes aren't really about making things bigger. Uh, I mean, that's kind of useful maybe for, again, you know, reviewing the surface of the moon. But for stars, it's not really about just enlarging the object. It's about capturing enough light to see an object that's faint. So telescopes kind of play a different role in that respect. And their magnification is not nearly as, as prevalent. Okay? We can still calculate it and it's still relevant. But if you're kind of wondering why, um, there's that difference. It's because magnification is not as important for telescopes. Okay, but let's add the rest of the description here. Is um, the there's still an objective and eyepiece, so that's the same terminology for telescopes. And I'll say, unlike the microscope. telescope creates a final image that is at infinity, which is really just means that you can view it with your relaxed eye. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the formulas and make sure they make sense. All right. So this first formula is just defining, the P equals one over F formula, is just defining something called the diopter, okay? So when lens makers make eyeglasses, they measure them, measure them in diopters. Okay, so P is for diopter, don't ask me why. Okay, and all the diopter is is just a reciprocal frequency, okay? So the diopter then would have, um, I said frequency, because I saw the F, but that I misspoke. Of course, what I mean is focal length. So the diopter then has units of one over meters. So its units are inverse meters, m to the negative one, because it's just one over the focal length. So in other words, if I had a lens that was a converging lens and had a focal length of say 20 centimeters, okay? Well, that would be positive because converging lenses always have positive focal lengths by definition, okay? Because they're on the opposite side of the source. 
the focal length is. So then my diopter for that would be 1 20th, okay? So it would be point, point 0.5, right? Excuse me, point, um, point 0.05, okay? Um, so that would, that would just be my, my diopter power, okay? Um, my diopter value. Then the other thing then to consider is if you have a diverging lens, a diverging lens always has, by definition, of negative focal length, so its diopters will always be negative as well because the formula doesn't, you know, it, it, keep, it preserves the sign. So if you have lenses with negative values of diopters, those would be for people who have myopia because that means they're using a diverging lens. If you have diopters that are positive in value, then that would be for someone who has hyperopia because they're using a converging lens. Okay, um, so the next one is angular magnification, next formula. Magnification. Okay, and so then we just have the angle of the object. So let's add the label in there. So it's the angle of object. It's the angular size. And then this is the, um, oh, excuse me, actually, that's the, yeah, the image. And then this is the angle of the object. Okay. And so how does that work out? Well, if we think of the angle of the image, that's just the height divided by the focal length. And then the image of the original object, well, the maximum angle would be if you put that object at your near point. And the near point is 25 centimeters. That's the human near point. That's the closest you can get something to your eye and still focus it. Near point, 25 centimeters. So obviously varies, but that we're taking it as kind of the typical healthy eye. Okay, and so then the biggest size an object would have would be at when it's at your near point, and it would then cover an angular size of y over 25. So then if we're talking about angular magnification, then we're going to end up with a angular magnification of always 25 centimeters divided by the focal length of the um, the lens, and if you if you keep your focal length in units of centimeters, then you don't have to convert your human near point because then the ratio of centimeters over centimeters will cancel out, and you'll get a magnification, which of course is just meant to be a number without units. Um, the diagram below um, shows that that concept. All right, so this is from your book. This is just showing the um, the angular size of an object without a lens, and then we're seeing when we add a converging lens, we see then we have the angular size of our image, okay, with its h prime, right, that's denoting the height of the image, which we would use in the, the traditional um, magnification formula. But we can see then its angular size is represented like that, okay? And then f is the focal point, and then lowercase f would be the focal length, just the distance from there to there. That'd be f. Okay, so there we have angular magnification. Now, we're not gonna see it with the microscope, so let's take a look at the microscope. This is um, using the exact um, lettering from your book. So this is the overall magnification of the microscope is equal to the magnification of one, which is the eyepiece, um, or sorry, the, um, that's actually the objective. So the magnification of the objective multiplied by the magnification of the eyepiece, okay? So that's, that's the case. When we're talking about total magnification, we're just multiply, multiplying the two magnifications. Magnification of lens one plus magnification of lens two. Okay, well, the magnification of the um, of the objective is just negative L over F naught. Okay, um, as that's really F O. F O represents the focal length of the objective. That would be this distance right here. That'd be F O. And then L is just the distance between the two lenses. Okay, so it's the distance between the lenses. Right, and that's so that that's our magnification from the objective. The eyepiece magnification is just the human near point divided by the um, the focal length of the eyepiece. And actually, 
can be clear on this. This this formula right here actually is, I misspoke when I said we're not using angle magnification yet, because this formula right here, the 25 centimeters over the focal length of the eyepiece, actually is using angle, angular magnification, which is why we use the lowercase m to denote it, whereas here, the uppercase m represents traditional magnification, which is just a height over height, okay? And, or in this case, a length over a focal length. Good. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And that's your formula for the overall magnification of a compound microscope, a two-lens device. What about for the telescope? Well, for the telescope, we're just interested in using angular magnification, okay, right, right out, right away. And to do that, then we um, we think about what's happening with the two lenses. All right, so we've got the height, the height of the image in both cases. Okay, so this right here is the height of the image divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. And then this right here is the height of the image divided by the focal length of the objective. The height of the image cancels out. So then we get the interesting result that the total magnification of the telescope is just the focal length of the objective divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So that means that the focal length of the eyepiece actually makes the overall magnification less and less. So you don't want to have a very high focal length for the eyepiece because then your overall magnification is going to be quite low. You need a low magnification on the eyepiece and a large magnification on the objective in order to get an overall effect of a large magnification for the telescope. Okay, so um, let me add some labels to these and then we'll wrap up this video. So this is objective focal length, eyepiece focal length, All right, and this is height of the object or height of the image. All right, we already know what theta and theta naught are. This is just the angle subtended by the um, object, or sorry, the, the image, and then the angle subtended by the object. All right, and then L is the distance between the lenses, or really the length of the microscope. So length of microscope because it's assumed that you know, the lenses really are either end of the, the far ends of the microscope. So you can see L is the overall length of the microscope. Um, and then we already, we already know 25 centimeters is the human, human near point. Um, yep. And then we already know what F naught or F O, I keep saying naught, but it's actually letter O, and F E uh, represent. Okay. So good. So mostly you're going to be um, you know, putting these formulas to practice, but make sure you understand uh, where they come from um, for the purpose of a potential uh, consequence.